I'm delighted and honoured to have the opportunity to participate in this wonderful RSS tradition. I want to talk to you about some problems that have been exercising my mind for over 25 years. They originated in somewhat related circumstances. In 1991, I was running a CSIRO statistical research group scattered around Australia, and these were researchers working mainly in quality management and quality improvement. I felt I needed to learn something about these areas, so I went to <coughs> the, uh, the uh, W. Edwards Deming four-day course in Sydney. That was the last year he ever gave one there. And at one point he made the statement that the number three person in a company should be a statistician, which raises a fairly obvious question. If so, what should this person be doing? Then about 18 months later, having actually adopted quality management as the way we ran ourselves in our research group, I arranged for us to be evaluated against best practice management guidelines. To my, or our great surprise and shame, we came out worst in how we used data and information to manage ourselves. And I had, within my group, a number of people who were evaluators for the Australian Quality Awards. So that raised another fairly obvious question. What sorts of data should be in the regular monthly reports that I looked at? When I started exploring this question, I discovered to my great astonishment that nobody had ever appeared to have solved this problem for any sort of enterprise. Uh, so one wonders how on earth are company boards and leadership teams able to do their jobs well? Searching for the answers to these questions is what has absorbed most of my research time since then. So that's um, what this is all about. I want to talk a little bit about um, the variety of settings in which performance, me performance measurement uh, situations occur and some of the many monumental failures that have occurred because people don't understand performance measurement. Then I want to spend um, the bulk of these comments just ske sketching, because you've all got the paper in front of you, um, a generic approach that I've devised based on alignment with what I call stakeholder value. And I'll explain this in the context of the original problem that I worked on, which is performance measurement for an enterprise. And then I'll make a few brief remarks about other applications. So here are a number of quite different settings in which performance measurement issues arise. And uh, the first of these is what I call scenario one, in the, is, uh, is exemplified by scenario one. There are many other aspects to it. And here is scenario one. You've just been elected to a board. You've never been on a board before. You haven't even taken a company director's course, but you do know that um, board members have individual and collective responsibility for what happens with the company. And the board papers have just come around in advance and you're starting to go through them. What sorts of numbers would enable you to exercise due diligence um, in regard to being a director and so stay out of jail? Because you can go to jail. Here's another class of problems with which most of you will be quite familiar, um, rating academic institutions and rating research. And there are a host of issues to do with that. I don't think this little red button will work. But, uh, measuring research quality, ranking graduate departments, allocating research grants, and so on. And so I've exemplified that with scenario two. You've just been made DVC research at a university that hasn't been performing well in the last few years, at least for research grants, and so it's sliding down the, um, this, this dreaded league table. And the national assessment criteria have resulted in an edict from your vice-chancellor that all research must be published in tier one journals. And as a consequence, all your researchers are abandoning the pursuit of research projects 
which are of considerable benefit to the community, which is actually the charter of your university, uh, in favour of smaller theoretical research activities that provide an opportunity for publication in tier one journals. How can you turn things around? That's an actual problem I've worked on. Um, improving workplace safety. Um, improving workplace safety culture, improving culture more generally are all issues to do with performance measurement. Efficient and effective implementation of public policy. That's another scenario that I sketched in the paper. You are <coughs> just become Minister of the Environment and you've had a meeting with the head of your department. Uh, I think even this country is subject to drought, isn't that right? Anyway, you've seen the latest forecasts and for the next several years water is going to be hard to find. And so a major national project has been launched to encourage every household to make use of grey water by putting in dual reticulation and recycling used water, not too used, um, for other purposes in the house. And that's going to, it, there will be subsidies for this and that will have the benefit of not a, of an injection of funds into the, in, into the economy and that's going to boost employment quite apart from its initial pur purpose of saving water. However, the government wants to make sure that its money is being spent wisely and well. In other words, that the project is being, the program is being deployed efficiently and effectively. What can you do to make sure that happens? And another, another example is strategic planning and there are other examples as well, but I think that's all I've got in this page. So let me talk first about then about some of the great failures of performance management systems. For the last 12 months, we've had uh, a huge inquiry going on who, into misconduct in the banking, superannuation and financial services industry in Australia. The government was dragged kicking and screaming to, into this. They were forced to do it against their better judgment. And uh, the interim findings came out last September and they are really horrendous and probably apply to a lot of companies in this country as well. But in any event, we're talking about the largest financial institutions in Australia, uh, the, the biggest banks, some of which are very large and so on. A culture of greed, pursuit of, of short-term profit at the expense of basic standards of honesty. Use of net promoter score. Anybody know what net promoter score is? You, you do actually, I'll talk about it later. Uh, maybe say a few words about it later. You encounter it practically every day of your life. Um, from the executive suite at the top all the way to the bottom, people being measured and rewarded only by reference to profit and sales. A total lack of awareness at the board and executive level of what's going on, of bad behaviour in the business units. And um, where have, oh yes, I meant to point out early on in the first one, the culture of greed, here's some bad behaviour, continuing to charge people for fees for services long after they'd died. And, and it was known that that was going on, and they, but, but it was not known at the board level. At one leading bank, and this is now starting to roll out across the other banks, there are huge shareholder revolts. They are uh, revolting against the remuneration packages which the board has voted for itself and the leadership team. Heads have rolled at CEO and chair level. A quite different um, problem. This is a, a failure of performance measurement in relation to community consultation. Monsanto came out to Australia um, and started trying to sell genetically modified wheat. No dialogue with the community beforehand. Uh, it was a failure. It was re they were rejected and they lost a billion dollars in the process. They had to stop it. AT&T, that's an example from 1986 and I'll come back to it. On the one, they were conducting an enormous number of surveys. It was a huge um, organisation uh, they're running 60,000 surveys a month all around the world. 95% customer satisfaction as they were then measuring it. On the other hand, 
they lost 6% market share and 1% was $600 million. So why was there no relationship between the customer satisfaction and business performance? There was an absolute failure to focus on metrics that actually did were lead indicators for important business drivers. The Hasty Group, uh, maybe not so well known in this com company, certainly well known in the Southern Hemisphere, collapsed owing a large amount of money and when the administrator looked into it, he found that the board was failing to ask questions that would have elicited the fact there are all sorts of things going wrong in the forecasting of, of sales and everything else. Um, the Australian Research Council. Anybody here know about the uh, bibliometrics activities in Leiden, University of Leiden? You don't? They've got a whole group there specialising in bibliometrics. Um, metrics for measuring supposed research supposedly measuring research activity. This was adopted by the Australian Research Council. Um, it was <coughs> after setting up a little consultative group that I don't think had any statistician on it that knew anything about performance measurement. It had somebody who knew something about biostatistics and that was it. Uh, part of this was to classify journals, um, one, two, three, four, five in various tiers. And one university vice chancellor said, right, you're not allowed to publish in anything except tier one journals. So that led to the collapse of a really useful applied science journal in Australia because people didn't, um, weren't allowed to publish it anymore if they wanted to get funding and get support from the university. So um, those are a variety of settings, a variety of classes of problems and just a tiny collection of uh, examples of fa failure. Um, there are so many other examples. So now I want to talk or, or give an overview of the stuff that's in the paper which relates to developing um, a generic approach to in a particular context and that is performance measurement for uh, an enterprise. So what's the purpose of having a performance measurement system in an enterprise? That's rarely something you ever see anybody discussing, the few people that do work in this area. So I just make up the rules myself and this is what I think the purpose is. To provide the board and senior leadership with regular quantitative reports that allow them to be duly diligent in running the company. And the reports need to be comprehensive, they need to say where are we now and they need to say and this is where we're heading if we keep behaving the same way. And the other part of it is to provide everybody in the company with the quantitative information they need to do their jobs well. So what then should be the essential characteristics of um, the board report? Well, the, firstly those three items I mentioned earlier. Secondly, you want the report to give you some guidance about, you don't want a hundred things to work on, you want to know where are the two or three places I need to, that we need to focus attention this time around. What are our priorities? Um, and you will judge that by the things that will have the biggest impact on the business. And thirdly, you want to make sure that the metrics you're getting help to align what people are doing with the purpose of the enterprise. And there are lots and lots of examples of, of metrics that drive bad behaviours, not good behaviours. So my basic model assumption, which uh, differs very much from uh, what some of you may be aware of, um, balance, the balanced scorecard, is that the starting point is with all the different people who have got a vested interest in the success of your organisation. Um, and by vested interest I mean they're making some sort of investment. So owners of the organisation, which might be the government or might be private shareholders or might be public shareholders, they obviously invest their money Customers invest money for products and services. People invest their effort working for your company. They have a choice. They can go and work somewhere else. Um, your partners don't have to collaborate with you. They can collaborate with somebody else. And the wider community may or may not tolerate your presence. Um, so 
the thesis is uh, that you survive and thrive by creating superior value, in a sense to be defined, for each of those stakeholder groups. And this assumption suggests some sort of a structure for performance measurements. So there are the five stakeholder groups. And we're going to start by saying, well, that's what we're aiming to be. We're aiming for success with each of those groups. And those success measures are going to capture the value of the stakeholders' invest investment compared with what they could have got somewhere else. And in the long run, you have to be successful in all, with all those groups. In the short term, you might be able to get away with being nasty to your own people, but not in the long term. Now, these are measures of outcomes. They're necessarily measures of perception, or they're so-called soft measures. So the ultimate measures in this system are measures of perception. But you cannot measure on outcomes. You can't manage on outcomes. This is, uh, I think it was Myron Trubus who made this observation. Trying to manage on outcomes is like steering a car by looking in the rearview mirror. There are consequences of what you did in the past. So what's really needed uh, uh, is a set of lead indicators. And I call them key performance indicators. So these are a set of organisational level measures that tell you that you're likely to do a good job in the future. This is the holy grail of performance measurement. Really good lead indicators. And this little thing here is not something to do with the day of the week. It stands for W. Edwards Deming, um, an unusual man in many ways, uh, who never himself was in line management, by the way. Um, but he did have many great aphorisms, like, which some of which you may know, like uh, the beatings will continue until morale improves. Um, but the one that's more relevant here is, he said, management is prediction. And that's a really good statistical comment, and he was, of course, a statistician. And finally, at the operational level, so I talk about the strategic level, the impact outside the organisation, the tactical level, at the organisational level, and then the operational measure level, which is all the measures to do with monitoring, controlling and improving processes, and this is the area where 99.9% .9 of statisticians working in this area have spent their time. That's where all the interesting technical statistics is. So, there's the structure for performance measurement. In the article, I also talk about three principles. I won't go through those at the moment. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about how we actually can go about populating each of these levels. But before that, I want to talk about this um, very simple paradigm which Myron Tribus sent me many years ago in email. And this gets you out of jail when you're thinking about measurement, no matter where you are in the organisation or what you're doing. If we're trying to find, decide what to measure, you start by saying, what are the products or services being produced and for whom? How will they decide? You don't get to decide whether you're delivering a quality outcome. They decide whether or not it's excellent. And how can you measure that? What's the process that produces those? And then what do you have to measure inside the process that will tell you that you are likely to do a good job? So that's my, I call that the part of the Trivers paradigm. All right, so with that in mind, we come back here, we're going to make our starting point what we're actually aiming to achieve, success with all our stakeholders. We need measures of success that capture the value of each of these investments. But what does value mean? That's where we can come back to AT&T. So this was 1986, they had this catastrophic contrast of 95% customer satisfaction, 6% loss of market share, 20% of, of the company fired, um, and so on, after they'd received their bonuses, by the way. Uh, so Bob Allen, who was chairman of AT&T, put together a team of 11 people across the whole company, uh, headed by a guy called Ray Cordy Plisky, who is still alive and well. 
and they developed this methodology of customer value management, <coughs> um, which uh, Ray has um, work, uh, He's done countless case studies all around the world with it. It really did turn things around for AT&T. Um, it's a proven process. Uh, it gives lead indicators of business results. It gives actionable board reports. He very carefully designed the reports for customers so they look just like the financial reports. So the guys had no excuse for misunderstanding what was there. They knew how to read financial reports so they could read customer reports. And it allowed people, the people on the board and senior leadership to identify where their priorities should be. So customer value management is a continuous improvement process that provides an ongoing dialogue between the company and the, mar and the, and the um, customers, as you'll see. Here's the, ongoing, here's the ongoing dialogue. First of all, you actually have to design, design what is called a value survey. You then get everybody in the company focused on, um, customer, on customers and delivering um, value to customers. With the data available, identify the priorities that will have the biggest impact on the business from the survey. Make those changes. Tell the market that you've changed, you've improved. Go back and ask them, what do we need to fix next? So there's this ongoing improvement cycle here. So let's see how it works in a bit more detail. And I'll use a very familiar example, and this is basically Ray's example. Um, getting a mortgage and, and servicing a mortgage. So this is what's called um, a value tree. Over here on the far left, you have a concept of value. And value for customers means all things considered, is this worth what I paid for it. What's my perception of what I'm getting? And that will be based on the quality of what you're receiving. I don't I think you'll see this with the big guy. No, you won't. Maybe you'll see this. The quality of what you're, what you're providing um, and the price, the balance against satisfaction with price. Quality is um, the mortgage package and that will have a number of um, quality attributes which you which you uh, ascertain from focus groups. And then, importantly, is, um, whoops, I've gone where I didn't want to go, a business process, because the secret to delivering superior value is to improve the process that produces those outcomes. And so there is the sequence of experiences you have in interacting with the bank. And costs will be direct, and then be indirect costs as well. All right. We collect data, so the whole market gets surveyed. Uh, on a 10-point scale, you rate the institution on all of these, or every one of the branches in this tree. And you end up with a structured set of ratings all the way up until they finally give an overall rating of value, having thought all the way, th all the, way through the various drivers of value. Also, you um, collect some data on loyalty, you, know, you ask them their willingness to recommend, and depending on the size of the uh, market that you're surveying, you may well ask for demographic information as well. All right, analyze the data. You do hierarchical modeling. So over here, you model this, this rating as a function of these ratings. This rating here is a function of those all the way up to the top, where you model value as a function of quality and price. Uh, an important note here, what makes this a most unusual approach to satisfaction surveys is you get a guarantee that you're not missing anything important. Or you get an indication that you're not mi missing anything important because if you've got an inadequate model fit somewhere, you've missed something out. And I don't know any other approach to satisfaction surveys that does that. So you end up with results that look a bit like this, although they, they'd usually be presented in a table. So here we see an overall rating of 7.3 out of 10 for value for you, compared with your competition 7.5. <coughs> and that's made up of 
uh, a rating on quality of 7.4 compared with the alternatives with the rest of the market and 6.0. So you're slightly ahead on here, but you're behind there. More importantly, from your modelling, you get the relative importance of these branches. And that goes all the way down. So if you're trying to improve value, where are you going to focus attention? Where you're doing badly and it's carrying a lot of weight. You work your way down through there, down into the delivery process, where you're in real trouble. Go down to the next layer, which I won't show, but it turns out you need to focus on statements. Now, this survey has been focused on the decision makers in the market, the people who are making the purchasing decision, not the users. However, at this stage, when you look into statements, you go down and talk to your own customers. And you, and you develop a little transaction survey at this level. The statements, well, there'll be the statement itself, there will be the inquiry service that delivers good statements. Um, you find out from focus groups what are the most important things about the statements and about the inquiry service. And then you put, so these are the quality at, attributes of the outcomes, and then you find hard measures that will be little lead indicators of whether you're going to get good ratings on the quality attributes. Now this is, I should say, this, has been, this was largely designed, this whole process, by engineers, not statisticians. So, make the appropriate business improvements, communicate to the market, resurvey. So, what's that delivering for you? It's delivering you strategic metrics for customers, tactical metrics um, for customers and operational metrics for customers. So, and it also gives you links to higher level business drivers. Because we ask questions about how willing are you to recommend or maybe how willing are you to repurchase across the product line or something like that. And you can, you, by fitting value and um, that loyalty metric against value, you will get a curve that looks like that. I mean, it has no choice. It has to start at naught, naught, and it has to finish at, um, up here at 10 and 100. So there aren't many ways to get there in a monotonic way. Uh, they always look like this. Um, and the way you use this curve is that at the current value level, you're getting about 60% of your customers very willing to recommend you. Now that's what happened to AT&T when they ran their survey when they identified value as the important thing. That meant, because they had gigantic market share, they were in big trouble. They had most of the market, but you can see from this, 40% of their customers were out, out shopping. So that's why they were losing massive amounts of market share. So what you do, you can use this to say, well, we really need to be up here at 80% loyalty. That means we need to get our value score up a lot higher. All right. So this is the process that I learnt about in uh, 1997. I went across to Auckland and went to a two-day course by Ray Cordy-Plesky and I thought this was a beautiful process. Um, what he said was that AT&T managed the whole of their customer area on just three numbers. Relative satisfaction with, with value, relative satisfaction with quality and relative satisfaction with price. And I was busy building my stakeholder model and I thought, well, hallelujah. I mean, why can't I do the same thing for all these other um, stakeholder groups? So that's what I've been doing since 19... Well, I did for many years after 1987. I developed models for value <coughs> for the people working for the organisation, for partnership and for the community. And then after many years, I managed to work out um, an owner value tree. Now, I'm not going to go through these. These are in the paper because I want to get to the point of all of this. And that is our goal. We wanted a generic quantity board report that provides a concise overview of the health of the org enterprise that's comprehensive, captures current performance, predicts likely future performance. So what does owner value mean? Well, 
at the case I'm going to look at is the um, owner of a publicly listed company. That now publicly listed company has a lot of owners, right? all those shareholders out there. Now you can't all invi invite them all in to have an opinion. Um, so instead they have representatives. It's called the board and there is this notion that the board is uh, actually supposed to act in the best interest of the shareholders. Um, it's a theoretical notion which is clearly not being true in Australia's financial institution but it will be after the report comes out in February. So the owners in this case are, are the board, represented by the board. So here's my owner value tree and now it looks incredibly obvious um, so it only took me 10 years to, to figure it out. Um, here's the overall concept of value. All things considered, is, is putting money into this company a worthwhile investment? And that will be based on return on in resources invested, um, the risk associated with that return, and something called wellness. So let me look at each of these quickly. Return on resources investment are the returns themselves, and the annual business cycle, there's the business process that you have to work on to improve things. So it's the board that decides these are the things that matter. And these are the quality attributes of the returns. There's the annual business cycle. Wellness, this is the, the wellness of the company. So are you the supplier of choice in your chosen markets? That's what customer value, the customer value relative value score will tell you. Are you the employer of choice? That'll tell you about how your people feel. Are you the partner of choice? Are you the leader in, sometimes it's called corporate social responsibility, sometimes it's called something else. Are you a welcome presence in the community? And maybe are you a growth or value stock and what's the quality of your assets? So that's what wellness is. This was actually a term which came from somebody who's the most famous chairman in Australia. He's on about 50 boards. Um, and risk? Well, there are various ways you could describe risk. Here it's described in terms of three basic processes. Um, I uh, enumerating all the possible risks, detecting whether there are risks there and then managing them. So the overall value tree looks like that. So it's a little bit small print, but I've just put all the stuff you've seen onto one slide. What's it telling us? It's answering the question where should monthly reports focus? And uh, to my knowledge, this is the only answer to date that anybody's ever come up with. If, if you accept this stakeholder view of life, it seems to me uh, you are led fairly inexorably to something like this as a way of saying, there is the full scope of what you need to be measuring. And you need lead and lagger indicators associated with that. And that's what monthly boards rep reports should have. And if you're on the board of a company and you're, uh, you're a director and you're not seeing those, then in my view, you're not exercising due diligence if you're not asking to see them. Okay, and <coughs> so here's where we get the alignment with stakeholder value. Over here on the far right, this is this tiny, that's the right down at the level of the transaction survey that I showed you earlier for improving customer value. These little metrics drive improvements here, that comes up, drives improvements through billing, that flows through, drives improvements through customer value. We saw earlier how to connect customer value to a business driver and customer value is also driving through into wellness of the asset. And similarly, you add in all the other value trees that are and management processes and you end up with this complete diagram and I haven't mentioned Homer Saracon yet, uh, I've mentioned him in the paper and I've written at length about him. He was the guy in 1948 who taught the Japanese how to manage and there's, an, there's a reference to an article that I've written about that, it was not W. Edwards Deming, it was Homer Saracon and he had this lovely little diagram uh, which I, with his permission of his daughters, have been allowed to reproduce. And in the last few years of his life, I talked to Homer what I was, about what I was doing here, and he was really happy with that as capturing in quantitative form 
what he was on about in 1948. So, um, that's the initial problem that I started working on and that's the generic approach that I developed, which is using as an organising principle the notion of alignment with stakeholder needs as manifested in the tri Tribus paradigm. And that provides, as I think, a natural organisation of outcome, output and in-process measures and clarifies the contrasting, ray, um, the contrasting roles of soft measures, measures of perception and hard measures. The ultimate measurements are not hard measurements. Um, the example that I sometimes use is I mean, it, there are plenty of people out um, in the hard world of finance and associated areas claiming that all that matters is a quantity called EVA, economic value added. Anybody know what economic value added is? <coughs> well, associated with any given um, sort of investment I mean, <coughs> is some, some measure of risk. So if you put money in the bank, then there's a very, very low measure of risk and so you expect a small return on it. On the other hand, if you invest in something fairly ropey, there's a high risk associated with it and so you want a much larger rate of return. And so associated with the different industry sectors, there's something called alpha, which is the extra amount above the safest possible investment that you want to make to take that risk. Anything above that alpha in that industry, that's your economic value added. <coughs> and so according to um, Stern and Stewart um, company in the US, they say, well, all you need to know is the EVA and then you can go ahead with the investment. With the investment. I don't think that's right. That's, yes, it's a hard measure and accountants like hard measures. Unfortunately, that's not how you make decisions. Now, once upon a time, GE was a great company. Uh, it's currently being destroyed, destroyed by a net promoter score. I'll tell you about that later. Jack Walsh was running it and he was driving it forward with Six Sigma and other things and floggings. And he, and so you might be sitting opposite me and I say, right, and then you say, right, I'm very happy to invest, give you the money, $100,000 I want to invest in GE because um, this has got a terrific EVA. I say, okay, uh, I'll take your money. And then I say, oh, I've got a bit more information for you. And you say, oh, what's that? And I say, Jack Welsh is leaving. <laughs> and you snatch your money back. You've got a perception. It's not just the EVA, it's some, a whole lot of other things. The ultimate metrics are soft measures, measures of perception. Okay, so where, where am I? Oh, I'm going to race through this. I'm a bit running over time. I'll just quickly look at these other situations I talked about earlier. Uh, ranking academic institutions. Um, examples in the article and associated references relate to these three different areas and in each case the tribus paradigm gives a logical basis for defining a set of metrics. For example, look at the issue of ranking institutions. There are two questions that never appear to be asked. Who are the customers here? Who's asking the question? There are probably several different groups. And what would they regard as quality outcomes? That will be very different for the different groups. And if there's more than one group of customers, how are priorities going to be allocated? So you start asking the right questions. It may not be easy to answer them, but at least these are the right questions to be asking. Managing culture. Poor company culture turned from top to bottom was character was especially pointed out by the Royal Commissioner in his interim report. Culture really matters. There's a lovely book you can download. Louis Gerstner, who says elephants can't dance? He was the CEO of IBM and you can download it for free. And he's got this lovely statement here and that uh, I hadn't appreciated it. It's got more in it than um, it's love, I like the last little bit in particular, but culture is everything in a company. Oxfam is in a disastrous state now, and not just Oxfam, but practically every other 
by association every other aid agency in the world because of bad culture in one little place. Ma safety culture. This is absolutely notorious. Um, Typically, if you're uh, the, the report, what gets measured associated with safety is safety statistics. Five minutes left, thank you. It's all too late to be measuring how many people died, how many people lost limbs, how much equipment got damaged. You're measuring, these are all out, they're outputs of the process. You've got to go upstream and measure safety culture to prevent these things happening in the first place. And current commercial, and there's a whole talk about that, current commercial approaches are deeply flawed. Um, efficient and effective implementation of public policy. What performance measures are associated with, wh how do you get the performance measures? This is an absolute greenfield site for statisticians. Nobody's done a thing. I can't get a project to work on. I can't find somebody prepared to <laughs> let me take it on. Two things are called for, development of a gen general approach to identifying um, what would be in effect a whole web of performance metrics and developing all the modelling and analysis tools for this quite complex data set. Stakeholders and strategic planning. There's a very famous quote, uh, probably due to Eisenhower, that plans are useless, useless uh, but um, planning is essential. I have, over the many years, um, accident, without realising it, developed an approach to strategic planning, introducing um, strategic planning, which is focused on who are the stakeholders for the planning process, what are they going to want in five years, align your strategic objectives with that. It really appears to work. I've been doing a lot of work now at Carnegie Mellon um, College of Science. Um, introducing strategic planning that way. And when you do that, because you're focusing your objectives on the stakeholders, the natural metrics to measure your progress are just the value metrics. So, all right, some final thoughts. There's a real need for systematic approaches to problems of performance measurement that provide the much needed rigour of statistical thinking and sound statistical practice. Uh, I'm proposing to you that this is one legitimate way to go. I'm not saying it's the only one, but it's one way to go. And there's scope for people, statisticians, to have very considerable impact on important issues in board governance, um, management, assessment, workplace safety, culture, planning, good government, lots of other areas. Uh, acknowledgements, lots of people to acknowledge. In the, they're listed in the paper, they're listed in my book. Um, and in particular, one absent friend, <coughs> Toby, for whom I'm indebted for a lot of things, really good friend of mine, a good friend of some people in this room. So here's a challenge for the post-session discussion. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. So you can see this is just to prove that I actually read the paper. So you can see my, my highlights and annotations on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so I read the paper a number of times. So I, I'm really grateful for the Society to give me an opportunity to propose a vote of thanks to Nick Fisher. Um, for what is essentially, I think, a thought-provoking paper, it challenges the statistics profession to engage to a greater extent in performance management than it has done to date across, I think, three areas, government, business, and academia. As you can see from the talk today, it's inter interspersed with examples and also helpful historical context. It presents a systematic approach in relation to benchmarking, prioritization, and monitoring. It advocates an organizing principle, coupled with the need to establish a link to higher level business, uh, business drivers and to identify priorities based on effect size. Now, to me, if I sort of break that down, it feels to me it's a paper about establishing causation and estimating effect sizes. And some of the things I'll talk about are a little bit about that. So I thought I'd go back to the RSS um, logo and the strap line, um, which we worked on a number of years ago, data evidence decisions. And I think this paper fits in very nicely with the idea of data evidence decisions. 
And as Nick has highlighted, there are multiple stakeholders, whether you're working in government or industry, um, and they all ask different questions. And they ask multiple questions. And they all face different decisions. So the data collected and the evidence assembled, essentially what you're trying to do is bring it together so you can make reliable decisions. And I certainly find Fisher's presentation of the visual aspects very appealing. Being able to follow through and see if you're trying to communicate this to a group of people at a higher level in an organization, at a board level, as well to communicate it visually, I think is incredibly important. And also secondly, it helps you to identify the data that you need to answer the questions. So um, I work in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, in a service sector, and I thought a little bit back about, well, wh where do I see a lack of statistical thinking in, in, in what we do here? Um, and actually, the areas that I find um, really we're missing is in terms of, first of all, is representation and sampling. So who do you actually sample in the first place? So if you're sampling customers, if you're sending things out to customers, who do you actually send it to in the first place? So actually defining what the denominator is and what the sampling frame is, is a statistical area that I don't think we spend enough time on. Missing data. I mean, when you get surveys back, Nick talked about asking, asking various stakeholders. But when you have missing data, what do you do with missing data? Uh, it's a classic issue for statisticians, but is it really used uh, in this sort of context? And the third one is independence. So are the data that you're getting from these surveys independent? And I, I've sort of given a, a bit of a, an example here, for, sort of from my, own, from my own area, where we have a number of different customers. Those customers are, are pharmaceutical companies. We have a number of projects. A number of people work on those projects. And we send surveys out to those customers and ask them a whole number of questions, very similar to the, the sort of surveys you have, 1 to 10, et cetera. And you, some people respond, and some people don't. And some customers say, we can't send you surveys, or you can only send the surveys every year, not, not for every project. So you get into this idea of, sort of what, what is your sampling frame, and how do you pull this together? And I think this is another area where statisticians haven't been involved enough in, is when you aggregate the data, how do you take into account the missing data, the sampling frame, um, and the, the, the main non-independence of data? So uh, often I see crude presentations of data. And I, you know, I would go back and challenge, challenge the teams and say, what are you actually estimating here? So that's bias. The other area I think the statisticians is, is variability. Um, and you mentioned in your paper about um, league tables in education and health. Um, we, know, we all know that it's used by the users to predict the future. So the idea is, is even though we know it's not true, people will take the data of the past and assume that the future is going to be the same. And in, in a lot of cases, it's data equals all. So if you look at um, uh, school leak tables, you're collecting all the data on all the examinations taken. But that, in effect, is just one realization of the many realizations that there could have been. So uh, what exams were set, what questions were set, which schools did, 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 did parents decide to send their children to? How did teachers decide to join a, a certain school? Who decided to have their exam paper remarked? And who didn't decide? And what was the remarking? So this is just one realization never to be repeated. And I think I, the, the like, what I like about Nick's paper is the focus on the drivers. Because understanding what is driving the results and the performance metrics is really important. So I think that's a key element that comes out. But I think essentially that whole idea about what is variability in this context is really hard to get your head around. And if you're, if you're trying to estimate some sort of physical constant, the more data, the better. In this, con in this context, it's very hard to know what the variability really is. Um, you mentioned lead indicators as the holy grail. And I would agree with you entirely on that. That is my experience. Um, easier said than done to work out what a lead indicator is. And every board would want to, have, to, want to know what the lead indicators are. And I wanted to pick up here a little bit on digitalization. So with digitalization, 
boards have near time or real time access to data. Lots and lots of data. So prioritization is. is talked a bit about you know, spending habits and loyalty. Um, and now there's, there's data being collected on the internet essentially about um, purchasing history and, and loyalty. Effectively, it, you know, have, has there been a, a repurchase? And you're seeing machine learning being used all the time there. And it's very interesting in the sense that you know, the view there is actually probably maybe not so much to identify the drivers, but really to predict well. And those models change all the time. So there's a real short-term nature to the, to the models. In fact, sometimes the models change, not only the parameterization, but the whole model will change with time because the main driver is, is what, you know, does it predict well? It's about the decision. Now, if you're a traditional statistician, I think a traditional statistician focuses more in terms of sort of models, parsimony, so what, as few parameters as possible understanding the relationships, the quantification, the weights in your, in your paper. Taking that, really understanding actually what's happening so that you're thinking more in a long-term sense rather than a short-term sense of maybe a, a sort of uh, what we're moving to perhaps in terms of sort of the short-term loyalty. And as I was going through the paper and I was looking at your, your trees, what made me think a little bit was, was Pearl's work, Judea Pearl's work on causality and whether you'd actually thought about putting it into that sort of context. So Pearl, I've actually quoted 18, but it's actually his, his causality book that I was working with from, I think, 2010. Um, tease out, you know, he has that, those distinguishes three, three areas. Uh, association, so what if I see? And then intervention, what if I do? So he introduces that do operator. And then finally, the sort of counterfactual what if I had done? And so it seemed to me there was a potential alignment of your visualization with the, with the Pearl work. And I'd be interested to know your, your views on that. And then just finally, one comment on the, um, I think in your paper, figure, figure four, and you presented it before, which was about how loyalty related to the scores. Um, and I just wondered to this extent, I, I, I understand the shape of the curve. I would, hand, understand, uh, I would be interested to know how portable that is through time and how portable it is across sectors as well. But certainly if you can find that, that relationship, then it's, it's, it's a very useful thing to have. And then just to finish off, um, you know, I do think, you know, Nick, you've picked up on a very hot topic. I think you're right to identify that this is an area that statisticians should be more involved in. And I saw um, recently this, this editorial in the RSS journal um, A, Guy Nason. Um, I'm no expert on the teaching excellence framework, but he makes some very interesting comments here. So this is, uh, I think this was a response by, by the RSS, which uh, uh, Guy authored. So there's a lack of quantification and presentation of uncertainty throughout. So again, hitting on your quantification. Uh, I love the next quote. This is a cracking one, isn't it? So far as we can tell, the TEF does not actually assess any teaching. <laughs> it can't be more of an indictment than that. Um, and then the final one there is a very long sentence, and I suspect it could have been longer. There's a few ands in there. You know, you can sense the frustration coming out. But overall, the RSS's view is that there's a real risk that the consultation's statistically inadequate approach will lead to distorted results misleading rankings, and a system which lacks val validity and is unnecessarily vulnerable to being gamed. So thanks again, Nick. I think you've hit on a really important topic for, uh, for statisticians, and uh, I, uh, I enjoyed reading your paper. Thank you. I think it's great to propose some scientific and systematic thinking. I think it, in many of the media-led, particularly, processes of the 21st century, there seems to be a lack of thoughtful looking at data, wondering what the purpose of the organization is. That one particularly hit me right at the beginning. I'm sure not many organizations really debate what are they trying to do. It's all about, oh, we're going to make money. We're going to be sustainable. Oh, we might not pollute as well. The whole idea of the framework where it's embracing the people in the organization, the customers, all the stakeholders, 
I think there's a real lack of taking that wider, more holistic view. And I think that's why many companies across the developed world are ending up in such a mess. And if only they would draw out and discuss their value chains. It goes right back to the beginning revolutions in quality management and statistical process control. Get the people in the factories who are producing the goods and the service things involved in collecting the data. Let them analyse it. Let them put it up on the wall so they can see the trends and what's happening. But everything is getting hidden in boardrooms now. It's a detachment from the workforce. It's a detachment from the customers. It comes out scandal after scandal that customers were lied to. They make protests. They say they're not happy. Some organisations seem to manage this. Ryanair have figured out a business model. We sell things, we sell airline seats cheap, we take people to different places, our customer service isn't very good, our customers tell us that, the rate is low, but they keep coming back because they're doing a job. And as long as they do the trade-off between price and pleasantness, then they maybe can get away with it. But they've went through, I think, and thought what their purpose was. Having said all that, and I endorse the approach completely, it's a difficult one because organisations are made up of people and people are fundamentally irrational quite often. Um, the cognitive psychologists like Fishkoff and things continually point out how people perceive risk differently. To go back to the airline example, there seems to be a concern about flying, but not a concern to drive to the airport to get a plane when you're 10 or 30 minutes late and maybe not paying enough attention. So the evaluation of risk is exceptionally difficult. And I think there's a lot of input can come from how to make people understand risk better. An area that the RSS has been trying for many years, since its inception. The problem too is the social cultural influences. We've got many people all try and make a point. They, they refuse to to take a consensus of an opinion. And we're seeing that in the current government and all the carry-ons that's going on, that rather than work together for a common good, different factions emerge. And that's going to be difficult to manage. So having a, a purpose of the organisation and referring back to this value tree, then that might help a bit. But there has to be some agreement over the measures used and the weights. And that's another huge area. And the work still to do, that's an eternity of work that's there. And it's going to keep changing. Because values won't stay fixed. And you've seen all that you now with how customer values are changing. The internet is disrupting shopping patterns, the so-called death of the high street. And that is perhaps because many retailers, they should have seen this happening, some probably did, but they were probably frightened to face it. Things are working for the moment, I'm going to get a bonus next year, let's just keep it going, rather than have disruption. So disruption cha disruptive changes are happening all the time. And potentially with the advancement of technology, they're beginning to be quicker. And there's environmental change. There's disruptive individuals. The US is undergoing, in their public sector, quite a big disruption. These things are hard, perhaps, to predict. 
So when management is prediction, how is this going to be done? The whole idea of looking to the future, horizon scanning, is all going to be very important. But at the end of the day, it's down to people. Who are the experts? What makes them know about the future better than other people? You've got anchoring. Soon somebody puts an idea forward, someone else <coughs> thinks that's good, follow it, or they go the other way. The whole idea of groupthink emerges. So there's a lot of underlying psychological problems. So get rid of the people, use big data, take measurements all the time. But that is inherently difficult as well. People are more likely to say something's not good than to say something is good. So there are a lot of places like going through an airline, press a button if you got through security nicely or well. The majority of the people that are hitting that are often, or a disproportionate number rather, are the ones that are saying, I, had a, I got searched, it was a hard time, so they hit the red button. So the automatic collection of data or the real-time collection of data can be problematic as well. I think this is to do with a lot of leadership and management being too remote and worldwide. They're not walking the talk. They're not getting down and understanding what's going on. They're not talking to the customers. They might talk to big corporations who are customers, their CEO or whatever, but they're not, they're getting divorced from reality. And I think the, the banking fiascos have been an example of this. But it's happening everywhere. And universities is another one. You gave the, I was very interested in your comment about the Australian universities and the, their assessment of research in the UK, research excellence assessment is the same thing. There are universities that were maybe not like in the top tier, but they were doing a really good job. Many of these, I'm kind of speaking from experience here, have lost their way. They'd, they'd have applied research, they'd do consultancy and work with local businesses. That's going because they're saying, no, we have to get excellence in research. And they don't have the traditions, they don't have the background, they don't have the resources. And it's, and in this process, students have been forgotten about. Their purpose was for education. Now it's like, oh, we used to have face-to-face -face contact 12 hours a week. No, six hours a week now because we've got to do research. And students can go and learn online or do what you want. So they're a mismatch of purpose. So we need the, the type of things that Nicholas was speaking about, but we need to try and get leadership and management to take it seriously and become involved in the production of it. And um, <clears throat> so I guess that, that's my kind of main rant on this, that we need to do more measurement, more understanding of what's required to be measured and educate people on how to use these measures and stop getting excited by social media and this has to be done or this is the latest new way of doing it. Statisticians have been doing this kind of work for a long time and I think they do need to have more say and it's all about variability. So I'd just like to Thank Nicholas again for this. A lot of work to be done, but I, like other votes that are on tonight, I propose a vote of confidence in this one. It's a fascinating topic that I don't think as statisticians we've addressed nearly enough. Of course, I come very much from a public sector perspective, and it's been a big issue and a growing issue in relation to the public sector. And statisticians, I think, have shied away from it 
often in this country because we think it's more of a sort of a media issue or a political issue. And one of the difficulties is if you talk to the man on the Clapham omnibus, statistics and performance indicators are often synonymous. And they're often um, forming their judgment about statistics based on the league tables they see in the papers, the performance indicators they're given. And uh, it's important that we address this. And the RSS publication from 2004, Performance Indicators, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, by Sheila Bird and, and colleagues, was an excellent paper, but we've had very, very little since. So I welcome Nick's approach, and I've been trying to translate it into the fields that I work in. I really welcome his, the clarity of his model and the fact that he makes a distinction between decisions that are made on a normative basis and those that are made more objectively. And I think that in the public sector, we very often um, fail to make that distinction, particularly when we do things like we weight um, the component parts of a performance framework. I also welcome his structured approach as to how we should build a greater understanding of the value of, of performance indicators, his concept of the importance of lead indicators, and how we might improve the theoretical underpinnings. So as I say, my experience comes from the public sector, so I'm interested in their use in the NHS, in the university and academic and research sectors, internationally in the UN, um, and because I'm a, a trustee of a number of charities, and the charity commissioners are very focused on performance indicators. Um, but there's very, very little in the training you receive as a trustee of a charity as to what you should collect, how you should address it. Um, so statisticians, I think, have a particular role to play in terms of helping governors of various uh, public sector organisations. In the public sector, unfortunately, frequently, uh, performance indicators are used as a stick rather than a carrot. So they're not used really to drive, um, to, to drive uh, performance. Um, they're not owned by those who are being assessed or called to account. And indeed, the definition of a stakeholder is often interpreted in a much narrower way than Nick proposes. There's not enough thought given to who the customers are. My own experience when I was working in the NHS, going undercover for 18 weekends, was that those with responsibility for collecting the data often had little appreciation of why it was being collected, and it wasn't being fed back to them in a constructive way to help them improve their services. So it was no surprise that as a result, data are manipulated in order to hit the target. Um, but in doing so, they often completely miss the point. So the problem of unintended consequences of what Nick talked about in his, his presentation is driving bad behaviour. A problem that we're all familiar with is that the focus has often been on what can be counted at the, at the expense of the more tricky issue of measuring the quality of a service or a product. And I'm interested in Nick's um, discussion of, sort of, of soft measures and how those might apply in the, in the public sector. I think the difficulty um, in the public sector has often been that we've got problems in aligning the efforts of the people with the mi overall mission of the enterprise. Just a couple of other issues. In large, complex organisations, it can be extraordinarily difficult to achieve an appropriate balance between local specificity, ownership and relevance, and comparability over space and over time. Um, when I was working in the UN, I felt this in relation to the Millennium Development Goals and now the Sustainable Development Goals. And you have the situation where those countries who develop and own the statistical tools wield the power. So the whole issue of, of how we ensure that we're doing this within a framework that empowers people at different levels within the organisation, I think, is important. 
I'm also interested in Nick's comments as to how we achieve an appropriate balance between timeliness, which is important if we want to take actions to improve our services and products, versus frequency, because there's an inherent risk that we mistake noise for signal if we gather indicators over too short a period. So it's a similar issue, I think, to the one raised early, earlier about variability and bias. Um, Nick raised something which he didn't in his paper, which is that he's looking for examples. So I have a college that he can come and work in, um, where we're trying to look at how we align our strategy with the measures that we give to um, my 48 fellows, who are the, uh, the trustees of my college. And one of the problems we've got is that we're in danger of being victims of our own success. So the more successful we are, the more the business model is broken, because the more students use our facilities and so on, and money doesn't follow use. And that is a problem that unfortunately doesn't usually occur in the private sector, does occur a lot in the public sector, and particularly in the NHS. And I guess with a daughter working in the N NHS now, you must um, be a, aware of that. Um, I have colleagues who work in, in the management school in Oxford, and one of the things that they're spending a lot of time on now is what they call intrapreneurship, which is how you drive change within organisations and how you use good statistics to drive that change. Thanks again to Nick for a framework that certainly has made me stop and think differently about how I, I collect and use data within my own organisation. Um, a very valuable contribution to the statistics uh, publications. Thank you. I'd like to congratulate you, Nick, on drawing attention to a vitally important domain which would clearly benefit significantly from more statistical thinking. But the title of the paper seems to be missing a word, perhaps corporate or organisational or enterprise or something like that, because, of course, the measurement of performance has been explored in very great depth in many different fields, including athletics, medical, medical work, racing cars and so on. You measure performance in all of those areas. In fact, I myself have written a book on measuring performance of supervised classification rules, clearly very different from what you've been talking about. The implicit assumption, I think, that performance must be about organisational performance perhaps explains the lack of reference to a very large technical literature on measurement theory. I've also written a couple of books in, in that area and <laughs> noticed the gap. In particular, in your paper, no mention is made of the fact that measurements in the area of corporate performance that you've been talking about are necessarily what's called pragmatic as opposed to representational. Pragmatic measurements um, are characterised by, by the fact that the two fundamental questions, what should be measured and how should we measure it, are opposite sides of the, the, the same coin. So that the how of the second question is determined by the what of the first but also vice versa. Furthermore, the paper says the issue of performance measurement as it relates to an enterprise is really multivariate. So in measurement theoretic terms, corporate performance indices are what Alvin Feinstein called clinimetric measurements. That is, they seek to summarise multiple attributes into a single index as opposed to psychometric measurements which seek to measure a single attribute using multiple items. Your opposite sides are the same thing, and I think yours are clearly in the clinometric mould. Now, it's a general principle in statistics that solutions developed in one particular application domain can often be usefully transferred to solve problems in others. There are many, many examples of that uh, uh, in, in statistics over the last century. And that suggests to me that it might be worthwhile looking at the development of clinometric measurements in medicine and social sciences to see how they can inform your work. The paper says the holy grail of performance measurement is to find lead indicators of success. I don't think that's quite right. Surely the aim is to find lead causes of success, along with ways of measuring those causes. Indicators alone are of limited value if they're not causally related to successful outcomes, and you, you really sort of acknowledge that. 
But better still, I think, one needs to construct a, a mimic model, a multiple indicator, multiple cause model, things going in at one end and coming out of the other. The other and it's in the middle is the thing that you're interested in. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to commend you for drawing attention to, and a quote, distinguishing between attributes and in-process measures that have desirable consequences and those that, although seemingly good for the business, may have undesirable consequences elsewhere in the system. Uh, I've um, experienced precisely that in the retail credit industry in situations where the sales division and the risk division failed to communicate adequately. So one of these divisions thought it was doing wonderfully, but because they weren't, commu <coughs> weren't communicating with the other division, the business was suffering. A holistic uh, perspective can be critically important. I wonder uh, <coughs> if there should be a, a further warning. Um, be aware that circumstances can change so that what seems reasonable now, perhaps before the program commences, might not be reasonable later. But I'd like to conclude by congratulating you on a very stimulating paper. Thank you. Starting with what I thought was hugely, hugely uh, persuasive of the idea that rather than going for generic things that one measures because that's what you're supposed to measure, you actually construct the tree and you end up with things which are specific to the organisation. You, you then have the analytic phase, which Nick, quite rightly, because that wasn't the focus of his paper, didn't go into detail about. And then you come out with your, with your measures. And I wonder if, Nick, in general, as I say it's a bit peripheral to the theme of the paper, you have thoughts on a couple of issues to do with what then goes to the board. Because my, my relatively limited experience of being on a board of, of a, a charity and lately of a, of a not-for-profit company is that you want to get, when you get, get some information presented from you, I, one point Denise made, which I just want to echo, is you really need to understand how much of what you see is signal and how much is noise. And when you talk about presenting data to the board, I presume that in some sense what you're actually talking about is presenting uh, your best guess at the signal that's derived from quite complex multivariate data, then that immediately to a statistician like myself um, raises the question, is there an effective way of conveying to people who are presented with what is essentially a, 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 a summary number, firstly, the inherent precision and imprecision in that number so that they can have a, a way of making sensible decisions in the face of uncertain information without necessarily being formally technically trained in probability and uncertainty. What, is there a, it seems to me there's a, a very big psychology of that which is, which is uh, really needing a lot more investigation. A second comment uh, is one that again I think echoes what I think Denise said, is that I think there's, there's a real danger in, in the idea that, that if you collect more data you must in some sense have more information. And in particular, the notion of actually what is the optimum frequency with which you respond to information as it comes in, uh, and is the traditional time uh, scale for making decisions still appropriate? Uh, I suspect it, a lot of the uh, time, uh, time scales on which decisions are made in a lot of organisations are really based on practices that were feasible a long time ago because of the limitations in technology. It's not necessarily the case that with faster technological acquisition and processing of data, you should make faster decisions, but it's at least worth, worth asking the question. And then, and then finally, the other point I felt is that when you've got that rather lovely tree structure to look at all the different dimensions that you're working with, uh, I, it's probably unfair just to take you um, verbatim with what you said in the presentation, but I think you kind of said, this is the number we need, to ch we need to change, so that's the one we'll focus on. But there must be an element of the extent to which certain inputs are modifiable more than others. And presumably there's a balance between how important it would be to change something and how easy it is actually to affect that change. Um, thanks. Got very two very brief points. The first thing was that I was really struck by the similarities between the structured approach to performance measurement provoked by Fisher uh, and more sociological ideas such as program theory. And it really seemed that the idea of performance measurement was to build a program theory for an organization and try and fit all the measurements into that program theory, which seemed amazing and very, very hard to do. But the second thing which no one has mentioned is, can we actually find the measures to go in the different levels of that? So in my own work in healthcare, I do tons of things on cancer. Um, I know for lung cancer, we've got like a third of patients who are going to die, at least within a year of diagnosis. So Garrett raised the issue of selection bias. In that, we've got 
the fact that we can only get feedback from patients who are still alive. Even if that's not a concern, can we actually ask patients for meaningful feedback on situations where they definitely do not want to be and are only there because they need to be for treatment? They can't compare having lung cancer this time with having lung cancer a previous time, what we really hope they can't. Um, so in that situation, how do we think we can get meaningful measurement? So I can see the use of this for commercial organisations where people can compare customer service between organisations, but when you're in a situation where there is no real comparison to make, I find it a lot harder to understand how it can work. Having said that, I found it fascinating, and thank you. The term, and I think I've made this point in the paper, uh, there's a lot of stuff in the paper that's not here. I was just trying to give a, a brief overview, and that, that uh, pertains particularly to Professor Diggle's comments. The term performance indicator is used in an incredibly um, wide range of circumstances. There is a book by this guy, Parmenter, that I reference. Parmenter called himself the king of KPIs. His book is called Key Performance Indicators. It is stuff full of performance indicators. It, um, he doesn't see, see the need to distinguish between lead and lag indicators. Now, Years ago, I arranged a research workshop at uh, NIS, uh, sponsored by the ASA, on measuring research quality. And um, what emerged from that was when we started looking at all the work that was going on in measuring research quality was hordes and hordes of, research, uh, of performance indicators of research quality. And I was getting increasingly frustrated because indicators of what? They hadn't defined the target. And finally, Jim Rosenberger, and I mentioned this in the, in the paper, said, oh, he said, you mean we're engaging in Texas target practice? <laughs> and I didn't know that term. But in Texas target practice, you take your gun and you fire it up against the wall. And then you go and draw the target where all the shots mm -hmm. gone. So there's this huge amount of work on performance indicators, but it starts in the wrong place. You've got to do what Myron Travis said. It's somebody out, you know, you're trying to hit a target. What's the target first? Then you can work out about performance indicators. I think that, and several of you um, sort of touched on that in, indirectly. But um, uh, another thing is um, the issue of how often you should survey. This is really um, market dependent. Some markets are really slow moving. Some markets are really fast moving. Um, one of the things that I um, developed years ago and we ran it for a few years. Well, it's a continuous survey. You're continuously accumulating data. We were running a survey of community attitudes towards methods for managing pest animals in Australia. And since you can accumulate, you only need relatively small samples of data. This also addresses one of your points, Peter. You only need enough data to get to make a reliable decision. Now, I didn't show you, but in my book, you will see, and I end the paper there examples of what a board report should look like. And yes, there should be, um, uh, there will be the summary values, but then there will be a graph associated with how these summary values being behaved. There will be also be a little indicator of what the precision is of that number, and also an indicator of has there been a significant movement since the last time you saw these numbers. And in fact, I think that board reports monthly board reports should suppress numbers where there hasn't been a significant movement. You should be focusing on the ones that matter. Um, and they should be, and because of this particular approach where all the stakeholders, all the measurements of stakeholder perceptions are made the same way, once you understand how to do customer value or people value management, and you see the reports for that, you know how to interpret all the other numbers in those reports. Um, so I've sort of drifted away from the issue of how often you should sample. Um, you, can, you can sample continuously and you can, it's really important to monitor at an, a rate appropriate to that market so that if there's a change and if your models aren't working sufficiently well, the market's changing in terms of what's important to them, you better go out and find out what are the attributes that have changed and the new things that have come in. Um, in the, in, the, in the people, in people value management, 
uh, what happened a while ago was all of a sudden working from home became something that was quite important. And if that was not in your survey, then you were not getting a good survey model. Uh, what else can I talk about? I was going to tell you about Net Promoter Score. Have I got a couple more minutes? Yeah. Right. Um, I've just published an article about this with Ray Cordy Plesky. Um, Net Promoter Score you encounter uh, almost every day of your life. You have a little transactional interaction with uh, the NHS or, tel or Telco or something like that, and at the end it says, um, please just stay on the line for one more moment. On a scale of 0 to 10, please um, rate your willingness to recommend, that, rec recommend this um, company to somebody else. Now, you might just be the person um, on, on the telephone Whereas the original decision, the real decision maker is, the, is somebody miles away. Anyway, you're asked to do that, not to 10. If you have rated them a 9 or a 10, you're called a promoter. If you've rated them a 0 or a 6, you're called a detractor. And if you, are rate, if you rate them 7 or 8, you're ignored. Net promoter score, introduced by uh, a complete charlatan <laughs> uh, who got a paper into Harvard Business Review, all you need is one number. The percentage of promoters minus the percentage of detractors. And that is what's being used by some of the largest companies in the world, all the banks in Australia, the National Health Service, uses NPS to benchmark performance. Now, if you're looking at percentage of promoters minus the percentage of detractors, how do you boost NPS? Get rid of all the detractors. I mean, it's just, it is such a stupid metric. It is not customer friendly, it's not business friendly, but it's cheap because what that guy did, once he got this published, was to call all the company, a lot of the big companies using customer value management and saying, how much are you spending on your market research? 100 million? I can handle it for 5 million. You'll say, 95 million dollars, I'll just get you one metric. And he went along and um, provided this and had a look around the company and said, oh, you need to fix this. And then all of a sudden, Ray Cordy Plisky started getting these calls. Well, um, we're not, from middle management, we're not getting any actionable data. There was this huge disconnect, uh, which is an issue you were talking about, between uh, people did not get actionable data down at the, at the middle management or lower, knowing what to fix. All that NPS was doing was collecting um, one number which is often totally unrelated to an overall value, and there's been, never been a demonstration of a clear connection between NPS and business results, because there probably isn't one, unless it's... In, the, in fact, GE apparently is now plunging, because that's what they're using. Um, there was, oh, so I've got well, 30 seconds to promote my latest virus. Um, if you... Uh, ask for to provide an NPS rating, please put a zero, and then when they say what was the main reason, you say, because uh, you are using NPS. And please, tell, <laughs> and please tell 10 other people, because I want to poison this thing at the roots. <laughs>